The Accord project is part of a larger five-year project which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK and that's called Transforming 19th Century HIP, Historically Informed Performance. We wanted to explore what was different about the sound of a 19th century string ensemble compared to the string sections that we hear in uh, modern orchestras today and period instrument orchestras today and what we know is that the sound of a 19th century group of strings is very different to what we hear in ensemble playing today but we wanted to experiment and find out exactly why. So in order to do this experimentation and investigate what a 19th century string section might sound like, we needed to get players who were willing to do really crazy and outlandish things that they'd never normally do in professional life. And we were lucky in that the bigger project, Transforming 19th Century HIP, had run chamber courses and conferences and we'd had lots of touch points with players who were particularly interested in 19th century style. So we brought together players that we know as researchers, players that we know professionally from some of the leading European HIP ensembles, and one or two people who we'd never met before but were just particularly interested. And we just put them in this room in a giant melting pot experimental laboratory for five days to see what we could do, how far we could get down the road to 19th century style ensemble playing. What makes it unusual is that half the research team are historical researchers and the other half of the team are empirical musicologists. And having this diversity of skills on the research team uh, it, it is a truly multidisciplinary research team and that enables us to do research that simply couldn't be done by historical researchers on their own. So on the empirical side, we're collecting data from three perspectives. Um, first, the player experiences. Secondly, quantifiable aspects of the performance. And third, um, audience experiences. And we're doing that by using actually three different data collection methods. In the first instance, to collect that data from the players, we're using an online polling app and a kind of a specially designed bespoke interface to present the, the players with, with sounds that they have made, with, with music that they have played, so an audio stimulated environment in which they can recollect what they were doing and thinking at that time. And the second uh, empirical method that we're using is to use a whole array of contact microphones attached to every instrument in the ensemble so that we can pick up what every individual player is doing whilst they're playing, both in rehearsal and in performance. So these individual contact microphones send data to um, a digital workstation where we d record their performances on, in, in a digital format. And then using the software Sonic Visualizer, we can look at those performances and out of that we can detect every single onset that uh, is going on in each individual player's part and from that say something about the interactions between players within a section, say the second violins, and also the kinds of interactions that happen between the sections of the orchestra because one of the things that we think is different about 19th century playing is a kind of different relationship in the interaction between different sections within an orchestra, a kind of more flexible relationship and these data from individual instruments allow us to kind of see whether those things are going on in the recreation of that kind of approach that we're investigating here. What's interesting actually about what we're doing is this is the first time that, that such a large array of contact microphones has been used in a large ensemble situation. 22 instrumentalists in this case, um, and that is a much larger number of players than has ever been you know, experimented with to track interpersonal um, timing data in a large ensemble situation. So it's a very unique project from that perspective. And the third kind of data that we're looking at is audience responses. We're using questionnaires with kind of rating scales and with more freely given verbal responses and also kind of post-concert discussions in which the audience can tell us something about what they've heard going on during these rather unusual performances of a very familiar musical repertoire. The virtue of this um, three-pronged data collection method is that we can triangulate these perspectives 
from the players and what they thought they were doing, from audience members and what they heard, but then also what's actually happening in the sound itself. Some of the things we've been working on, um, the players will have encountered before approaches to the way we shift from one position to the other on string instruments, so portamenti, audible shifts, um, some of the bow strokes some of the players will have encountered before, even though they tend not to be used that much by many of the period instrument orchestras. But what is really new to all the players is the idea that we can sometimes deliberately not play together. And getting used to changing the bow at a slightly different time to the person next to you is quite tricky. Um, in order to make that a little bit easier, what we've decided to do is use individual music stands rather than having two players at a desk. Um, because we really want people to feel able to use much more individuality than perhaps they do in other ensembles that they play with. Um, and getting used to this idea of the asynchrony is tricky because players are brought up from a very early age being taught that the, the most important thing they must do is play in time and together with other people. Um, and it's also quite a subtle thing, how much is too much, how much is not enough. Um, and there are times when it feels like the players are doing you know, a really large amount of asynchrony and it's hardly audible. And there are other times when they don't feel like they're doing so much, but actually it comes across as sounding too much. So really experimenting with what works and what doesn't. Experimenting with how legato the bow changes are, the speed of the bow changes, that all comes into play. And one of the other key things about this ensemble is that it's the first time a whole ensemble has used heavier, uh, thicker strings with higher tension in gauges that would have been available in the 19th century. So sometimes we've had to get strings specially made, for example, for the double basses. Um, and in other cases, the, the instrumentalists are using strings that have a much higher gauge than, than they normally would. Many of the violinists are using, a, for an E string for this project, what they would normally use as an A string in, in other ensembles that they play. And so we're interested to see how that affects the sound and also the bow strokes that we use. The idea is not that in the course of five days we can um, arrive at a definitive point and say this is how 19th century string ensembles sounded, far from it. It's a toe in the water, uh, it's introducing a huge number of new concepts to players and what we're hoping is that it will just be enough to whet their appetite, to go back, to experiment. Some of the players here are chamber musicians, some work in different ensembles. We have a very wide international spread, people from Canada, Canada, the States, Hong Kong, all across Europe um, and what we're really hoping is that this will get people talking, uh, get people experimenting in their own playing and that actually it might just uh, provide one extra form of expression that people can use to make really engaging performances of 19th century repertoire. So most cellists nowadays will play steel strings typically. Um, so they're thinner, uh, heavier and have a very smooth surface uh, and are less flexible than gut strings. So um, that is the big advantage of these gut strings, that they're rougher, thicker and you feel the material more. Generally speaking, uh, you have more expressive possibilities on these strings because uh, the difference that you make in contact point and pressure and bow speed, they get uh, more amplified than when you would use uh, steel strings. So uh, that accounts for the more um, extended expressive possibilities of these strings.
in modern orchestras, uh, players have to follow um, a leader, the conductor, uh, the concertmaster. Um, of course, we have a leader in this orchestra, uh, but the players all have to follow their own compass. And that creates a sense of uh, spontaneity in the playing. So you will notice this spontaneity in our choice of bowing. So we could use uh, bow in opposite directions for a while and then find each other uh, in the next bar. Um, and also not playing together can give a certain warmth to the sound and uh, give sonoric possibilities that we wouldn't have if we would align everything. So playing with asynchrony creates a different kind of um, challenge, but also a different kind of joy, I think, in music making. So I'm the kind of person that likes to be very free when I play. So being able to play in this way gives me a certain kind of freedom. But because all of the players are doing sort of their own thing, in a way it creates a different kind of listening challenge because instead of listening to one thing that you're trying to trying to play with you're listening to many things so your attention is drawn in many ways in many places so you're being free and we're doing our beautiful phrasing ourselves but we still are paying attention to what's the cello section doing, what's the bass section doing, what is the first violin section doing. So in a way we're both more focused and we have to have our kind of listening ears on more than ever in a certain way. Um, I think also the challenge, one of the challenges is in certain places we want the music to be extremely together. So we go from this kind of blended style, blurry style, to some parts that are extremely together. And I think the change in the brain from this kind of artistic freedom <laughs> feeling and that really, really togetherness is challenging. It's, it's really a different kind of brain function. Audiences are used to listen very tight ensembles, very in tune, very tight, you know, very uh, structured, rehearsed. Uh, they are used to listen final products, recording products. And I'm only hoping that they can see this as what it is, you know, this new experimental result um, that it will only uh, it will only, it's, it's only the open door, you know, to other possibilities, other ideas, other ways of performing this music. This historically informed experience has been different for me than other HIP experiences in that the freedoms are of a different sort. And in earlier musics, we're really taught to um, blend in ways that are similar to our modern playing. But in this setting, the asynchrony provides a freedom that you don't get in either modern playing or in the earlier HIP playing. At the same time, so many of the same aspects that we're, we work on in our HIP playing for classical or Baroque or earlier music uh, come into play. The different sonorities that you get from the gut strings and particularly from these high tension strings that we're using. The strings we're using are a totally different experience than the gut strings that we use when we do Baroque or classical music. Because of the high tension and the, th the thickness and extremity of these strings, it takes a lot more weight of the arm and a lot more uh, emphasis, or shall I say, a lot more input in order to make the sounds that you're looking for. Of course, like any strings, they make a rather normal sound when you're playing in a sort of mezzo dynamic, but to get the extremes of the dynamics, the pianos and the fortes, you have to do much more work in order to either get the string started in a quieter dynamic or to really find that higher dynamic level that is beyond just a, a normal level. And of course the Tchaikovsky we're playing is full of all these extremes, these pianos and pianissimos and even quieter sometimes. And then the fortes, fortissimos, three Fs, four Fs, it's all there and we have to find all of that. Um, but these strings also make, especially those higher dynamics, much more possible than I think any of us could have imagined. 
from our Baroque training, we often think of these gut strings as strings that are quieter than their modern counterparts. But these versions of gut strings that we're playing on with the higher gauges produce, I think, upwards of an equal level of sound to the modern strings. Portamento is one of the most exciting parts of this process, I think. It's the gliding in between notes, which we're trained to do from a very young age as players in our modern repertoire, and particularly in this romantic repertoire that we're playing. But the manner in which we're doing it, in particular, the slower gliding between notes, the slower portamentis, and some of the types of portamenti, in particular, my favorite one is sliding on the same finger that you've used for the previous note, which is all but outlawed in our 20th and 21st century training. Uh, it's been very enjoyable for me to use that, and it opens up a lot of possibilities. And among the freedoms that are so exciting in this style is the fact that when you play in a section, in your modern orchestral training, you're taught to never do anything that disrupts uh, the sound within the section or um, is unusual from everyone around you. But in this newfound freedom of 19th century expression, we often have portamenti happening in different parts of the same musical phrase within a section. Or if, say, my viola section and the cello section are playing a melody in octaves together or something, there may be, among the eight of us, there will be eight different types of portamenti within the same melody. This is really exciting, and despite the lack of uniformity it creates, I think it creates something much more beautiful, the unexpected moments that you get when the shift of the sound between two different players or the entire section changes because of someone else's decision. I suppose there probably are drawbacks, but I haven't found any yet. I really enjoy the, the shimmer that is created when two people do a slightly different decision, somewhat asynchronously in this. I hope the experience of an audience listening to this music um, will be something similar to my experience hearing this kind of style for the first time, which is a, you know, an opening up of our ears to this, what this music can be. And I think one of the striking things about this rehearsal process has been to see all of the members of the group really engaged with each other and engaged with the music. So I think one of the real strengths of this working style is this sense of individuality. So each person is really responsible for the musical intention in the phrasing. And so I think the, the character and the life of the music really comes out in a very strong way. And I think maybe at first sometimes the asynchrony feels a bit jarring and we also um, are exploring portamenti which is the sliding between the notes that they use so that might be also a little bit um, different but I think it's the kind of thing that the more you listen to it the more um, you be you see the beauty in all of these techniques and also we see the beauty in the music. <laughs>